Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Jones. Welcome to Interchange, and thank you so very much for joining us. Lots to talk about this holiday weekend. How about the controversy surrounding Barack Obama's speech to a joint session of Congress? All the hubbub around that. Why? We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the businessman Mark Newman getting into what is expected to be a very crowded race to replace Senator Herb Cole. We will also talk for a moment about the proposal to make the Milwaukee County Board of Supervisors a part-time government body. And we'll talk about the state of organized labor as of Labor Day 2011. All right, let me introduce everyone. We have longtime newspaper columnist Joel McNally. Kevin Fisher, longtime broadcaster, political analyst, and oftentimes a fill-in host over on WISN Talk Radio. Denise Calloway, she's the coordinator of business and community partnerships for the Milwaukee Public School System. And education consultant and local job creation expert, Gerard Randall. Rick Horowitz, along with commentary at the end of the show. All right, the first thing we'll talk about is all the hubbub around the upcoming speech by Obama to Congress about his new plan to create so many jobs. First, it was going to be on Wednesday. And then the Republicans shut him down and said, no, it's not going to be on Wednesday, but because that would be too inconvenient because we're just getting into town that day. So then the White House says we'll do it on Thursday night, which gets NBC and Packer fans all nervous because that's the nationally televised NFL season opener with the Packers playing the New Orleans Saints. Finally, the White House says, don't worry, everyone. We'll do it on Thursday, but we'll be done with this speech way before kickoff time. I find this fascinating, actually, that the... President of the United States, usually, I, it's been my experience, he says, this is when I'm speaking to Congress, and Congress says, okay, but that didn't work this time. Yeah, well, and, and, and I, think, I think this is important. I mean, this is the President of the United States, and, and there's no more important subject in America right now than jobs and how we're going to create more jobs in this country. And for the Republican leadership in Congress to say, well, no, because may, may, the real reason, uh, we have a Republican debate that night of, of some of the weirdest candidates on the face of the earth that are running for president of the United States. Uh, you know, the, the business of the country should be more important than, you know, a, a bunch of Republican yahoos uh, in a whole series of debates. This is no big deal, the Republican debate. But th this is also the president of the United States. And we remember, you know, <laughs> One of the other recent, you know, appearances of the president of the United States, this president of the United States, before this Congress, uh, when a congressman yelled at him that he was a liar in the middle of the speech. I mean, no president of the United States has been disrespected this way by the opposition party. Uh, it, 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 it really is embarrassing. I think it should be embarrassing for Republicans. I realize they don't, aren't easily embarrassed, but, but seriously, this is the President of the United States talking about jobs and wants the Congress to act on jobs, and instead this Congress, the Republicans in this Congress, are doing everything they can to torpedo jobs, to oppose any plan to create more jobs, which is the most pressing issue in this country. Uh, you, I know what Kevin's going to say. He's going to say playing the race card. When an African, the first African American president of the United States is the first president in history to be disrespected this way by the Republican Party, and and uh, you know I just think it's an embarrassment for the Republican Party. But Kevin, I've heard I've heard a lot of Republicans this past week, couple days, say all it is is a campaign kickoff speech. Well, that's true. It is, and whatever he tells us next week at this speech will be his his plan for the 2012 election. Um, I don't know about anybody else on this panel, but when I'm a guest at somebody else's place, I don't just show up and ring the doorbell and say, hi, I'm here. Uh, I work it out with the people, and I maybe show up with, with a pie or something. Uh, the, 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 the truth is, there wasn't any disrespect here. Oh, uh, really? Since, since the beginning of the United States, uh, when the president wants to speak to a joint session of Congress, very quietly, behind the scenes, his people talk to their people and vice versa. The president needs to get the approval of both the Senate Majority Leader and the House Speaker. And he didn't do that. He didn't get their approval, so he leaks it to the press. And he knew, everyone knew, months and months ago that this particular night, the Wednesday night, had a Republican debate. So, so true. what? So, but but uh, it's, it's, it's not, obvious, it's obvious here. Debate. Now, I understand that Republicans are against anything Obama. 
I understand that. I'll make that admission here on television. But the president and his people and his, you know, the people who set his calendar knew this for months and months about this particular date. And this was a blatant attempt to show up the Republicans, take some of their steam away. Even James Carville, the Democratic strategist, said he thought he would prefer watching the Republican debate because he thought it would be more interesting. So maybe <laughs> maybe the Republicans did Obama a favor, and now more people will actually watch the, jo the job speech. If this president was serious about jobs and the speech he was gi giving, Two things. One, he wouldn't have gone and spent yet another vacation at Martha's Vineyard. And two, he wouldn't have waited over 900 days. It's been over 900 days since his last jobs plan and jobs speech. So he's, did, he's not, he's not really serious. Denise, he's, who's, who's he's not really to, serious about crazy. this, this item. Who's trying to you. make who look bad? Are the Republicans trying to make Obama look bad? Or is he trying to make John Boehner look bad? Well, I think the Republicans are trying to make the president look bad. It's, it's you know, just about anything this president has proposed, Republicans have said no to. You know, if they were, if, if the president were to say the grass is green, the Republicans would say, no, it's not, it's orange. Or maybe it's green, but, you know, it can really only be green if we cut taxes for the wealthy. The problem is that this is part of a continuing effort by Republicans to belittle this president, to make him appear to be anything less than presidential, um, and to really try everything they can do to take him off track and off message. They is have it, done everything they can to try not to make him look presidential. Is it working? This is the first time in history this has happened. I, I think these uh, <clears throat> these slip-ups have created uh, some problems for the president in that uh, now they are totally off message. The process has become the issue and not the substance of the speech that he wants to deliver. More people are going to focus on how they got to the presidential speech as opposed to what the president is trying to convey to Congress and the American people. I, in I think what I, is I, I really agree. coming across here, though, is that these Republicans are not interested in creating jobs in this country. Uh, and, and not if you it's know, not if it's the hold, holding up, not if holding it's up, rehashed. raising, no, holding it's up, leaked. raising the debt limit. They, they've they've already to they've leaked, the economy. They've leaked pieces of this already, and it's and it's rehashed. Is. Warmed over policy that they've tried to implement in the past unsuccessfully. Or any group right, that came this way, the president agree. trying to do this next on topic. a day when we had no Republican jobs businessman, it's Republican crazy. businessman Mark Newman said this week he's going to get into the race to replace retiring U.S. Senator Herb Cole. All right, so expressing interest so far on the Republican side, we have Newman, we have former Governor Tommy Thompson, uh, we have state legislator Jeff Fitzgerald, and a few others. And on the Democrat side, possible candidates include Congresswoman Tammy Baldwin, Congressman Ron Kind, former Congressman Steve Kagan, some people mentioned Milwaukee Mayor Tom Barrett as a possibility. All right, this is this is a long time off, Denise, <laughs> but, but this is a, like a, a year away. How do you see this shaking out? Well, I think... Uh, just like what we've seen with the Republican primary, you're going to see people in, you're going to see people out. Um, and what really is going to make a difference is how are people able to put together an organization that's going to be able to be effective for them during this primary campaign, and how are they going to be able to raise money? That's what's going to make a difference in terms of who's really in and who's really out. So, you know, I, I think um, at the end of the day, I mean, it's, it's really interesting <clears throat> to see Mark Newman enter yet another race um, for another um, for another office. Um, I, I think the advantage he may have is whether or not he can be the part the the uh, the, the candidate of the Tea Party. If he can make himself the candidate of the Tea Party, then he's someone to reckon with, because clearly the Tea Party continues to drive a lot of what's happening in Republican politics in this state. Now, your friend Tommy Thompson, if he doesn't get in, will anybody take him seriously again? No, and he will be in this race. Um, they won't take him seriously when he gets in either. No, but... he, he, he's being taken very seriously because there are a number of people who've already signed on to his campaign uh, who are raising money for him. Um, I think what you're going to see are so many candidates uh, on the Republican side who are vying for the, uh, the conservative vote that they're going to split that vote. And uh, I, and then Tommy Thompson, who has a still strong following in this state, will be able to capture the nomination. On the Democratic side, I think you're going to have uh, candidates that will focus primarily on getting the votes out of Madison and out of Milwaukee, and those will tend to be the more liberal voters. 
Um, and, and, and if you have a far conservative and a far liberal candidate coming into the general election, I think it's going to be just about anybody's game. In my view, it will probably be whoever has the best turnout, um, and that's going to be, I think, favoring the president. Kevin, on the, on the Republican side, who can raise more money, Mark Newman or Tommy Thompson? Oh, I would think Tommy Thompson, although uh, uh, Mark, Mark Newman is certainly... He doesn't enough, need to raise any money. He enough, can just use his own money. Mark Newman is his own wallet he can dip <laughs> into. Uh, but I don't see either one uh, of those two as automatically the front runners on, on, the, on the GOP side. For these reasons, Mark Newman, he has left a bad taste in the mouth of a lot of the base from the kind of campaign he ran against Governor Scott Walker. Uh, <laughs> he violated Reagan doctrine. Yes, he did. Tommy Thompson, while, while Republicans statewide have the utmost respect and gratitude for what he did as a public servant, he is viewed, and I say this with all due respect, as maybe uh, yesterday's candidate, and whether or not he can shape a message for the issues of today remains to be seen. So that's why I think you'll see a, a, a wide open GOP field with even more coming coming into the fray, whereas opposed on the Democrat side, and I know it's very early, but I see it shaking out as a one person race over there, and that's Tammy Baldwin. I think she's the front runner. There's an allure of her possibly being the first openly lesbian member of the United States Senate. She will draw a lot of attention and support and funding from the from the very, very far left, but that could also be her downfall, but that she's too liberal. It, it shouldn't make a difference, but can an admitted homosexual Democratic candidate get the support statewide that she would need? I don't know. Uh, I think she's a, a very good candidate and she's a very good politician, and, and that's why she's gotten as far as she has already in, in a conservative state like Wisconsin. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I think there'll be other candidates, including Ron Kind and... and uh, uh, perhaps some others we haven't heard yet. On the Republicans, I think the Republicans are in real trouble. Uh, first of all, you do have, you know, you've got a lot of people like Gerard who, who like Tommy Thompson and remember Tommy Thompson, but you've got one of the biggest national, you know, funding groups that support these Tea Party candidates running anti-Tommy Thompson ads already. Mm -hmm. And some of them are uh, the false, club, by the way. Club for Growth. I mean, and, and they're doing they're, they're that. Not, not very and, good. And, and, uh, and then you have Mark Newman, who seems to be a perennial loser and has negative charisma. And, and the Fitzgeralds uh, have really trashed, you know, their reputations by supporting uh, Scott Walker down the line and, and, and the whole, you know, subject of the recalls that may be coming up next year. Uh, I really expect uh, a businessman, um, one right here in, t in town from Bucyrus Erie, uh, Tim Sullivan, Tim, Tim, Tim Sullivan, Sullivan. Uh, to be the maybe the dark horse candidate, uh, but suddenly the front runner, uh, sort of like Ron Johnson came out of nowhere, um, more so than any of these rehashed uh, Republican. He may run as a Democrat. Um, yeah. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> I would have to change my opinion of him because I don't have a very high opinion of him. <laughs> David Clark, Democrat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. All right, next topic. How about this, uh, uh, the proposal that came out this week from one of the Milwaukee County supervisors saying, you know, instead of having 18, 19 full-time supervisors making 50 grand a year, why don't we just do part-time supervisors mm. making 15 grand a year and they could meet at night instead of during the day and that, that way we could get a lot of different people who might be interested in the job. Now, seeing as how this would have to be approved by supervisors <laughs> who would have to vote to do it with their job, like I, don't, yeah. I, mean, I don't think it's going anywhere, but I find the idea intriguing. You mean you're <laughs> suggesting that they, they wouldn't cut their own throats or no. uh, say, sure, I'll demote myself and chop my pay uh, yeah, that's why it's not going anywhere. But I, I, I am with you. I am I find intrigued. The idea I, I love, I love the idea. Uh, <clears throat> you, you just look out at Los Angeles County out in California, which includes 88 cities, including massive LA. Uh, they have a five-person county board. In the state of Wisconsin, we're the only uh, county, Milwaukee County, that has a full-time board with full-time legislative assistance, with benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and they can't, I'm sorry, with all due respect, they can't justify the, the, the full-time status, uh, especially in Milwaukee County where you have 19 incorporated municipalities, the, the, the cities, 
where their representatives, the aldermen, do all the heavy lifting. They do all the work. Uh, I, I like this idea, but it's, I think it's DOA. You have some people on the board, like Supervisor Weishan, who says it's political pornography, this, this, this suggestion, and, and another supervisor uh, who says it's, it's, it's a comedic joke. Uh, they won't have anything to do with even discussing it. But at a time when, you know, we, we don't need this much government and it's costing $850,000 a year where we can maybe save a, a lot of money uh, by getting rid of some of this really ineffective dead weight, I think it's worth exploring. But it was, it was created back in the 60s, obviously, for a reason. Right. There are a lot of models out there for county government. And this is just one of them. It will be helpful if it prompts some discussion about how to streamline government, make it more efficient, especially when it comes to delivering services in the largest municipality in the state. Um, th those kinds of issues are not going to go away. How you can make government more efficient, how you can deliver services better than, than, than what they're currently being delivered. Now, the flip to this is that you're asking supervisors who only know this particular model, because this is the model they've served under, to make some dramatic change. And that I don't see happening, even <coughs> though you've got several of these members who are not going to be running for re-election, and you would think that might be the catalyst for some real conversation about uh, overhauling county government. There, there's been a move the last couple of years and suggestions by some to do away with our form of government, make it more of a metro right. government Unit instead, of, like instead of aldermen's and supervisors. Yeah. Maybe we're going that way. I, I think there's it, metropolitan government makes some sense. I, I really do. Uh, but the idea of, of dismantling what, ha what really, I, I keep wondering where these ideas are coming from because the interesting thing about the county board is that it, it quickly became the most representative uh, ethnically. Of, of any of our governmental bodies. Uh, it, it was the first that, that you know, gave actually African Americans some chances for leadership and, and, and control. Uh, the redistricting plan that they're doing now will add two districts that, that quite likely Latinos could be elected from, which is much better chance at representation um, than in uh, almost any other level of government. So, so you know, uh, there are a whole lot of people who say, why are you talking about you know doing away with us? Because we're doing a good job of representing a lot of different interests that usually don't get represented. I, uh, I disagree with the people, Denise, that say that the, the county board doesn't really do anything. I mean, there there are there's a lot of important. They had to run the county, county when Scott Walker wasn't. Yeah, there's the county parks. You know, there's the freeways. Right. I mean, uh, there there are significant and important things to the commerce and safety of people in this community that the county board does work on and does work on every day. I, I think if we're trying to find efficiencies in county government, I don't think you do it by deciding you're going to have half-time county supervisors. I mean, we, we need to do a better job, better than we have, of taking a look at ways that we can have some savings um, in the court system. You know, we, we've talked about but haven't made progress on an overhaul of mental health, not only save money, but to make it more accessible to people, bring those services closer to them. I think there are bigger ways and, and ways that, quite frankly, are going to be much more impactful to citizens to take a look at ways where we can streamline government and save some money other than deciding you're going to have these folks who really are working full time to become half-time half -time folks, and, and why? So p meetings can be held at night? When I mean, if that's really what you want to do, when people then have, have the meetings hold, held at night, you know? Well, pick <laughs> up the phone and call Waukesha or Dodge or any of the other 71 counties and ask them, how do you do it? How do you get the job done uh, with a, with a part-time board? But they help are us, in a help us, help they us figure it out. Yeah, it's, it's, they are and, and in a lot of ways, so this, this the proposal itself is low-hanging fruit when you begin to put it up against those things that you all have just talked about, like improving mental health or improving uh, public safety or even public health. Um, those kinds of things have large price tags attached to them, and this will not do very much in, in order to address that. Okay, on this, on this Labor Day weekend, we have to take a few moment, moments to talk about the state of organized labor here in Wisconsin and across the country. Right now, would you describe it as healthy, as wounded, as dying, and if it is wounded and dying, is that a bad thing? What, what, what does the future hold? Well, there's a national column out today that uh, draws the reference to uh, 
that Happy Days episode where Fonzie with leather jacket on water skis jumps the shark and, and says essentially that unions in Wisconsin here have jumped the shark. I, I believe that to be true. That their, their power and effectiveness has been dwindling over the years and I don't think that they've actually strengthened themselves uh, in, in, in recent times with some of the tactics that have been used, the death threats, the, the destruction of our capital, <laughs> some of the intimidation, uh, the bullying. Uh, it's not going over well with, with, the, with the general general public. They tried to upend the no November 2010 elections uh, by doing all kinds of recalls and using every tactic and spending every nickel and dime. It didn't work. Uh, now they're, now they're uh, sending people out to, to school board meetings and, and, and trying to get votes in their favor. That, that's not, not working. Uh, WEAC has had to cut 40% of their staff. I don't see how anyone can say that unions are stronger today than they were a, a year or so ago. Are, are, are the glory days over? Well, the glory days have, have, have been over for a long time. It's been a, it's been a an uphill battle for organized labor. That's no secret. Uh, in a lot of ways, you know, I'm, I'm sometimes called a cockeyed optimist because I, I tend to have a positive attitude when the worst things are happening. <laughs> and boy, are the worst things happening to organized labor in, in this state right now. And what could be worse than, than the governor and the Republican legislature wiping out decades of collective bargaining uh, that have been agreed by Republicans and, and Democrats uh, for several generations. And but in a way, I think this is re-energizing organized labor. I, when he talked about death threats, I mean, Scott Walker doesn't make death threats. He just kills organized labor and, and, and kills collective bargaining. Uh, that's, that's a death threat if there, if there ever was one. Uh, but if you look at the New Berlin school board meeting the other night, where without organized labor, what what employers don't understand is why is that organized labor can benefit them. Organized labor is a way of organizing the workforce, keeping the workforce happy, having leadership on the workforce that can work with management to accomplish goals. And, and when you don't have that, you have what you saw at, at a New Orleans uh, school district, but which, Denise, which was passing rules saying how long the skirts should be the, of, your, of your teachers and whether, you know, what kind of slacks the men should wear. Uh, going back to treating employees like children, and I think there's going to be a real revulsion to this, to, to this whole, uh, you know, roll back all the progress we've made in organized labor. But it's, it's not just happening in Wisconsin. It's happening in a lot of states. Right, and I, and I, I think Joel's right in that, you know, the glory days for unions are over. We've seen a gradual decrease in the number of working Americans who are members of, of labor unions. But, you know, as we talk about Labor Day, the reason most of us are not going to work on Labor Day is because that's something that unions help to negotiate. When we take a look at time we have off uh, for, uh, we're paid when we're out sick. <laughs> or weekends. Or weekends <laughs> or, or vacation or, or other benefits that we take a look at. These are things that came about because of what unions help to negotiate for all employees, even employees who aren't members of unions. All right, we move on. With the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks just around the corner, we're learning more from some of that period's major players. Dick Cheney is out with a brand new memoir written with his daughter Liz. Anyone who expected a nice, mellow book will be disappointed. <laughs> Rick Horowitz never expected a nice, mellow book. Rick. Dick is ticked at Colon. Dick is ticked at Condi, too. Dick is ticked at W. There's every chance he's ticked at you. Dick is tops at settling scores. Dick preferred a few more wars. Dick is hot to sell some books. Doesn't care how crass it looks. Dick is ticked at Tenet. Dick is ticked at Paul O'Neill. Dick is ticked at media. His dial is set to full conceal. Dick will not apologize. Dick would rather patronize. Dick's so quick to condescend. Dick's still playing Let's Pretend. Dick is ticked for Scooter. Bush just hung him out to dry. Dick is ticked for rummy. It's not his fault Iraq's awry. Further is how far he'd go. Dick defends Guantanamo. Harder, cries our torture lord. Dick defends the waterboard. Dick is ticked from habit. Dick is ticked to goose his sails. Dick is ticked for payback. 
He's mostly ticked to hide big fails. Dick sees things in black and white. Dick, says Dick, was always right. No forgives and no forgets. Dick is Dick with no regrets. Thank you, Rick. And before I forget, an invitation to join Milwaukee Public Television next Sunday, September 11th, for a special presentation live from Cathedral Square in Milwaukee. The Milwaukee Chamber Orchestra and the Bel Canto Chorus will commemorate the anniversary of 9-11. It begins at 3 o'clock p.m. live. Thank you very much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend.